Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, How to Consume Your Data for AI, sponsored today by IBM. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Jay Lindbergh. Jay is an IBM Distinguished Engineer and Director of Product Management at IBM. Working within the IBM Watson and Data and AI organization, Jay is responsible for driving the business and technical strategy for the next generation set of cloud-based cognitive governance and data management capabilities to power data science and self-service analytics. Jay is an expert in the fields of data governance, data management, and MDM, and has worked with some of IBM's largest clients to define the de and develop industry-leading and innovative solutions. As an IBM master inventor, Jay holds 17 patents in areas such as machine learning, mobile device interaction, and application generation. Jay, we're honored to have you with us today, um, so I'll give with that, I will turn it over to you. Hello and uh, welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thanks, thanks Shannon, for that. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So, uh, delighted to be here today to take, take up an hour of your time to take you through you know, our, our view of the world around how you can really start to leverage the data that you've got across your organization and really start to consume it for AI. So, I'm going to take about an hour to uh, take you through the role of you know, how we believe modern asset catalogs can really give you that stepping stone into AI. Okay, and so let's get started. So we all know that you know there's a huge amount of digital disruption taking place. Um, you know we can see that you know, the large organisations, the incumbencies, if you like, within their uh, industries are actually becoming threatened more and more by smaller, more nimble organisations that are able to take advantage of things like you know readily available compute and uh, elastic scale through the cloud where these new, these new kind of new kids to the block can really start to disrupt the traditional uh, businesses that, um, that, that many of us find ourselves in. And so there's a growing recognition, in fact, everybody's talking about how AI can actually be the thing that will allow the disruptors to, uh, become, the dis <coughs> to become the disrupted. So really allowing the incumbencies to start to build AI and disrupt their own industries themselves rather than be become disrupted. So really what I want to talk about today is how we can start to allow our, these, these organizations to really start to apply AI technology uh, inside their business processes to, to drive that disruption themselves inside their own business. But there's a huge amount of challenges that um, kind of hinder the progress towards that. Um, and you know, we know that uh, you know, the, the, the growth of AI is going to be prolific, and you can see some quotes there. Um, you know, around kind of the, the type of growth that we're talking about. You know, this is really kind of a new wave of technology that we're very, we're, we're, we're beginning here, taking us through into kind of the, the early 2020s. And these challenges are the things that are already starting to inhibit how enterprises can, can, can move towards AI. And these are the things that we believe that we're able to start to tackle and start to remove some of those roadblocks. But let's talk about them a little bit. So on the data side of things, it's the traditional data management problems. Right, data resi residing in silos, um, you know, unstructured data, structured data, the differences between how data is persisted. How can we organize that and understand that and then put that in a format which is uh, ready for consumption by our, our data science team? How can we apply governance in a way, in a modern way, which really allows us and encourages self-service access to information by our data science community? How can we improve the skills associated with data science and building AI? There's a huge, with this a huge amount of growth that's taking place and the, driving the need for data science skills, they're in incredibly low demand. And so what can we do through technology to start to lower the entry point into becoming productive with data science and AI um, in spite of those low skills? And then finally, how can we provide tools and infrastructure that allow you to fail fast? How can you innovate around your data and bring your data and try what and, and try out how your data can be used to consume with AI and inside those business processes, but not spending huge amount of time, money, and energy on 
uh, you know, large projects only to fail at the very end. How can we how can we fail faster than this? Let's look at a, a typical kind of high level flow of, around you know what it takes to, to take a, a model and bring it into production. Well, as I said, there's the data problem. There's the huge amounts of enterprise data that gets produced. And that's data that you know maybe we have in our traditional systems, maybe it's data that's being generated by sensors externally, maybe there's external data sources, we've got cloud provided systems, etc. All this data is being generated. That data requires governance, obviously, um, to make sure that the data is used and consumed in the correct way. And then once we've kind of understood that data, well, then we need to put that data into the hands of our data scientists who are going to be building out our AI uh, models. And they need to not only be able to get access to the data, they then need to have tools available to them to be able to shape, cleanse that data, and get it in a format whereby they're ready to be able to use it and train it, train those models. In terms of the actual model building, well, there's a whole, a whole host of technologies and tools that are available that uh, data scientists, you know, each have their favorite type of tool, their, their, their favorite libraries, et cetera, that they want to use. There's really no, not much standardization around that. So they want to be able to work in the tools that, are, that, that suits their needs. And then finally, once they've kind of started to build their models, they need to continuously train them and then finally push them into production and have them being monitored in production. So there's an entire life cycle there that is relatively new to some organizations. Each step in that life cycle requires a huge amount of complex uh, processes to be, be, to be put in place. Uh, and, and therefore, it's extremely difficult to get into a robust, efficient practice for doing data science and building AI. And so this is where you know, IBM has, has, has tried to start to uh, reduce some of those barriers and make things simpler. And so IBM Watson is uh, our AI platform for business. And therefore, we have a whole host of capabilities that is designed to really drive that AI into your organization and make your organization a slick, efficient AI uh, and data science practice. Um, Watson includes you know, uh, out-of-the-box business solutions and applications that allow you to deploy chatbots and improve your customer care experience at, at, at your front end. But for the purpose of today, we're really going to focus on this Watson Studio uh, layer. Watson Studio is our building environment. It's our AI development environment. It allows you to easily support the full end-to-end -end life cycle that it takes to go and create AI uh, and deploy those models into production with continuous learning. Underpinned by the entire Watson Studio is our Watson Knowledge Catalog. And this is really where we're going to focus mostly on today. We took a very early decision with our Watson platform to bake into it an intelligent asset catalog. It's an intelligent asset catalog that ensures that all of the relevant information that is needed to be consumed by your data science practice to make your data science practice efficient and effective at building those models quickly is baked into that platform so that the data and the, and the AI assets that need to be consumed for doing data science are readily available and easily discovered. And the Watson Studio and the Watson Knowledge Catalog really sort of support the end-to-end -end life cycle that it takes to build that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, in more detail, the types of day-in-the-life data, uh, data science uh, capabilities that are required here. So if I'm a data scientist, then I may go and get a, a, a new project where I need to go and build a model to predict customer churn, for example. So the first thing I need to do as a data scientist is going to go and find the relevant data. I need to go and connect to different data sources. I need to access that data. I need to figure out whether it's structured or unstructured and how I need to work with that data. And that's actually a very big obstacle to um, uh, and time, time consuming time drain on in my path to create my overall model. So using our, our knowledge catalog, we've decided to focus on how we can alleviate those first pieces. And once I've found the data, I then need to go and prepare it and do some analysis. So included in the studio is our data refinery capability. Data refinery is our South service data preparation tool. So I can use this to go and shape and understand. I can visualize different aspects of the data sets and ensure that that data is in a format that is optimized for me to then uh, use for building my models. Then I can go and use the studio to go and start to build out those models. And we've really built a, a easy to consume set of tools that leverage uh, a whole bunch of different open source capabilities and frameworks as well, where you can 
at one end of the scale as a very deep technical data scientist, go straight in and start writing Python and R scripts in, inside, inside the, the, the tools. But in the spirit of trying to lower the entry point to the platform and start and, and addressing some of the skill shortage, we've also provided uh, lots of wizards and lots of help and to really try and ensure that if you haven't come from a data science background or you're not quite familiar with or, or as good on the coding side, then you can really start to click around and start to build out some really robust machine learning and deep learning models um, through the tool. And then once you've built those models, you can, at a click of a button, go and deploy them into uh, what's the machine learning runtime. And then once they're deployed, then you can monitor and maintain those models very easily and track um, things like accuracy and, and bias detection and all those other things that you need as you're running these, these models into production. So the studio and the catalog combined really solve a number of challenges. It allows you to find your data very, very quickly uh, and understand that data uh, so that you can then consume that um, uh, and use that inside uh, building a robust set of models and data, and data science uh, assets that you can deploy and run into production. So I'm going to focus on the data side of that diagram um, because I think this is you know, where many of our customers are really starting to figure out how they can get into, into the AI, AI space. Um, we estimate, and this is kind of a, a widely known figure, that um, uh, data scientists typically spend in the region of 80% of their time just looking for data. That's huge because we have more and more customers that recognize they need to do AI, and so they're investing in spinning up data science practices, hiring the best data science talent that's available to them, uh, using you know, the best data science tools that they can find. And those individuals are really not demonstrating their value to the company because they're struggling with finding information. And so we wanted to provide a way in which, with our platform, we could solve that problem for business by ensuring that data is given and, and made accessible and discoverable to people, to data scientists, much more quickly. So really starting to move the needle on that figure so that our data scientists actually have much more time doing data science. The other thing you noticed was um, we have you know, endless customers that have spent many years building out their data lakes. And very, very few of those customers have said to us that you know, our data lake has delivered all the promise that we thought it would when we set out on this initiative. There's an, and there's a number of reasons for this, uh, why this has become a challenge. You know, they were sold on the fact that data lakes as a concept in the industry will allow you to put all of your data in the hands of individuals. And it's not really happened. And so some of the reasons for that. Number one, lack of data governance. All right, so you know, if we've got a whole bunch of data that's important and, and I'm the data owner for it, well, maybe that's sensitive data and it needs to be governed. I'm not going to allow that data to be released into a data lake because I'm ultimately responsible for the governance of that data. If I put it in a data lake, then anyone can access it and I can't release it. So you're not having my data. So as a result, these data, these data lakes haven't really kind of built up a view of all of the information that's available across, across the business. Second to that is it's actually quite a long, complicated process to go through to bring data into a data lake. Once you've discovered, it, discovered the data and gone through kind of the business level approvals to get the data in, well, you then need to start looking at the data, looking at data mappings, and uh, maybe you've got to do some data masking or cleansing on the data to move that data into the data lake and make it available. That can take kind of in the region of three to four months to do that. So to bring one source in, it takes you know, that period of time. Uh, what about all the, the, the 20 other data sets that I've got, or the 50 other data sets that I want to bring into the data lake? It takes a huge amount of time. Spiraling Hadoop, Hadoop costs have also kind of um, had a factor in that as well. We've had more and more clients that have you know, put in requests for new Hadoop clusters to grow the data lake. And these, thing, these requests are, are now, you know, seem to be trending towards being pushed back uh, because the CTOs are saying, the CFOs are saying, hey, where's the value for this? Why, am I keep, why do I keep throwing money at this thing and you're not demonstrating value? All right, so there's some kind of challenges there. And then the final challenge is, for some of our customers that have gone kind of a little bit further down that road, they've got these data lakes running, there's good amounts of data in there, there's good awareness of, uh, around that, that data they're finding that actually that data is not being consumed efficiently or it's not being consumed at all. And that's because nobody can find anything. None of these users that are being told to go and consume data from this data lake are actually able to find it, they don't trust it, they don't know its provenance, and therefore it's the data swamp story that uh, I'm sure many of us are, are aware of. 
And so how could we start to not replace these data lake initiatives, they're incredibly important, but how can we start to, to ensure that the information inside that data lake is consumable for the data science practice? And again, this is kind of where we believe the role of these intelligent uh, uh, data catalogs really fundamentally give you that um, the way in which you can then kind of transition into AI. And you know, this curve kind of is a very high level view of you know, where we think this, this evolution to AI um, comes from for, for, for our clients. We've worked with our clients for many years. Uh, you know, we have some, some fantastic products that really allow you to run your information architecture. Right? They focus on uh, understanding where your data is, what your data is, providing intelligence and understanding around it, collecting data from your operational systems, et cetera, tracking your operational lineage, feeding this, these, this information into your data lake, kind of traditional metadata management systems where it's about collecting, understanding, and governing. But to get to the right-hand side of, that, of this diagram, where you then really have machine learning and AI as a practice where everybody can go and access and understand this information, it requires a different way of thinking around data cataloging. It, it requires you to start to think less about the process of collection and more about the sharing and the activation of that data across the business. The, um, the analogy I think about is, you know, if you think about uh, you know, an online marketplace, eBay, Amazon, whoever, all right, you know, they have systems that allow them to uh, inventory all of, the, all of the things that they sell through those marketplaces. But they don't open that up to us as a consumer. For us, they build a marketplace portal where we can easily go in and we can understand which products are available for us to buy and use. And that's really the difference here around a data catalog, is providing a business user-friendly interface where people can go and easily find and understand if the data is relevant to them, how they can get access to it easily, uh, and ensuring that there's a whole bunch of other capabilities that put the data in the hands of those business users. Because without that, you're not gonna be able to allow your data scientists to become more efficient, being able to allow them to find data more effectively, and being able to consume that information uh, for, for, for AI and data science practices. And we truly believe, going back to my earlier point on the first chart, that these organizations that are struggling to you know, disrupt or are worried about disruption from others, we, do, we truly believe it's the organizations that are able to make the most efficient use of AI to bake into their business processes, to develop new models, new business models, they are the companies that are going to be the ones that are able to disrupt and change the business models and ultimately uh, be the leaders in their market space. Okay, so let's talk um, you know, more specifically around you know, our own intelligent um, uh, asset catalog. So the Watson Knowledge Catalog, as I said, uh, part of the Watson portfolio. I really talk about it through these key, three key bullet points. Let's talk about discovery. So discovery is really the creation of the catalog. We make it really, really easy to populate your, your asset catalog to discover all of the sources of information that you have across your business. So those sources of information could reside um, you know, on IBM Cloud, on somebody else's cloud. Those sources can exist you know, behind your firewall. They can be IBM data sources, non-IBM data sources. We can connect to a whole host of different data sources. And once we connect to those data sources, we classify and profile the data that's there available at those data sources. So as we're going to go and connect to a database, for example, we will run our own profilers and we'll extract out and detect that there are credit card numbers in this data source or there are social security numbers or there's PII data inside this data source. And we store all of that information inside our rich metadata index alongside the technical metadata that we discovered in that data source. We can also catalog unstructured data sources. So with unstructured data, we can then profile the contents of that using our natural language understanding APIs so that we're, pouring out, we're, we're pulling out the key entities from those unstructured, those unstructured information. And again, we store that inside this rich metadata index uh, as well. We also integrate with metadata management systems. So um, you know, we obviously integrate as a first class with IBM Information Server so that we can populate this catalog with the information that's available already that's already been collected um, inside, inside our clients' uh, ecosystems. But we have APIs available so that you can also uh, integrate your other metadata systems into this catalog. Once we've done the discovery and we've got this rich view of all this information across uh, our business, 
we then can kind of roll that into the catalog phase. The catalog phase is where we then open all that information up to our business users. We have a um, you know, built for purpose, business friendly, shopping for knowledge portal, whereby anybody can go and find information that's available to the business. But it's really important that there's some capabilities as part of that shopping for, 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 for knowledge business uh, portal that, uh, that kind of is important to drive the, the, the intended outcomes. First of all, we catalog more than just data. Right? If we're going to be driving to improve data science and make that kind of a, a thing that's easy to do and efficient, then we need to make sure we can catalog all information assets. So it's not just data. We can catalog um, notebooks that are being created, machine learning notebooks. We can catalog machine learning models. We can catalog analytical dashboards. Um, a whole host of different assets that are able to be added to the catalog and shared and reused to drive those efficiencies um, uh, for, our, for, our, for our knowledge work. But also, because we've captured all this rich metadata, we know where our data is, what source it came from, we know what our data is, we know if it's credit card numbers, et cetera. Then we store that information and we provide our own machine learning model around it, whereby we've built um, a Watson recommendation engine into our catalog experience so that we can start to make suggestions as to other assets that could be relevant for individual users. Think about what Netflix does for data, or Spotify does, does for, 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 for music. If I go watch a TV show on Netflix, then Netflix will start to suggest other TV shows I may be interested in based upon my behavior. It's all powered by AI. And we've done the same thing with data. Based on my usage of the system, the types of data I work with, the other individuals I work with, then Watson will start to suggest other assets that I may have previously never found. It's exactly the same as Netflix. I would never have known that I needed to go watch Breaking Bad. However, because it was recommended to me, I actually found a TV show I really enjoyed. And the same is true for data. The most valuable data may exist in a silo somewhere else in a completely different part of the business. But with this Watson recommendation engine, it will start to surface those things up to me. And maybe, just maybe, that would be the best data that exists inside my entire business to train my model more efficiently than anybody else in my industry. So we use the intelligent metadata to, to do that. But the final point around the catalog is it really has to be integrated for productive use. Just having a catalog that's available for people to find information is great. But then what? What do I do with it? How does that help me do data science? And so we've integrated our catalog with our productive use tools. I can go find information, find the best information, and then I can go and click a button, and it's there available for me to use and do data preparation and data shaping or for me to go and do some, use that data inside uh, a notebook or use that data to go and train a model at one click of a button. It's, you know, going back to my marketplace example, if I was a user of an online uh, marketplace and I found the perfect coffee machine, but I wasn't able to add it to my shopping cart, that's kind of useless. So with our catalog, you can add this to your shopping cart and you can go and use it productively at a click of a button. And then finally, on the activate um, uh, piece, this is really how we've rethought data governance. Okay? Data governance is all about you know, protecting, understanding, and, and ensuring that data is used in the correct way. It's absolutely incredibly important that we still do that. However, if we focus on the consumption of data, how can we turn governance into something that really enables consumption? And so included in our catalog is our active policy engine. This active policy engine uses the rich metadata index to know what the data is, and then uses the policies that have been defined by the business to ensure that the data is used in the correct way. So let me give you an example. Um, if I have a data set that maybe has 20 columns in it, and one of those columns contains credit card information, credit card numbers, and there's a policy that says that I'm in a division or a department that shouldn't see credit card numbers. Well, in the old world, that data wouldn't have been available to me. But do you know what? In that data set of 20 columns, those 19 other columns could be the most relevant data, the, most, the best data that I need to build the best data science model or to run the best analytics. And so rather than lock that data away, this policy engine will determine what it is I'm trying to do with the data and who I am and what the data is and will mask on the fly those credit card numbers so that I can't see them. But it will open up me, me to the other 19 columns inside that data set that I can use. And then if somebody else with different uh, had different rules applied to them, they may be able to see those credit card numbers. 
but I can then use the data shaping data preparation tools to have a, a um, tailored extract to me of that data set with the correct policies and rules applied. So it's really power, powerful to be able to apply this to the data so that we can open up more data. Because as I said, this is all about driving those efficiencies, putting the most relevant data and the most important data easily in the hands of our knowledge workers so they can consume it and actually use data in a really efficient and effective way um, to, to deliver those better business outcomes. Um, and let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the value prop that we've seen and some of the kind of the stories that we've had with, with some of our clients in the space. And, you know, we've been working really closely with some of our clients as we've kind of been developing this, this, this concept and really focusing on how, you know, data catalogs can really start to be the key to how you consume your data for AI. And so, um, you know, the first three kind of use cases here are kind of related. They're all about driving data science efficiencies, but the detail is important here. So the first one is around how you can put data in the hands of those users much more quickly and, effi and efficiently. As a data scientist, with an intelligent asset catalog, I can find data quickly, I can be suggested data quickly, but importantly, I can understand the data quickly. I can visualize it easily and understand what's there. I can understand the different types that are there. So that's the first one. The second one is around how then that feeds into feeding yet the overall accuracy of our models. We discovered that um, a, a typical behavior of these kind of fledgling data science teams was that they may have two weeks to build a project uh, and deliver a model. And in that two week period, if they're spending 80% you know, of their time looking for data, they get to kind of the middle of the second week and um, they think, I've got to get this done, I've got to deliver this project. Therefore, the data I've got now is good enough. I've run out of time. Do you really want your um, machine learning and AI models being built on data that is good enough? Is that going to give you the type of differentiation that you need in your business, uh, working with good enough data? And so we didn't think that was acceptable. So this is you know, another reason, a good uh, reason why we wanted to really focus on making that data consumable and understandable. And then the third one is around kind of driving a, a data-driven um, culture across your, your consumers of your data. We discovered that uh, a typical data science project, say a project running for two weeks, the data scientist team there would actually create some very valuable assets. The thing they cared about at the end of it was delivering that model, making sure that model was delivered and delivered to the, to the correct individuals. But to get to the point of building that model, all of the data they've gathered, the data, maybe they've done some data shaping, they've written some notebooks, maybe they have some models that you know, weren't optimized and they decided not to use. All of those assets are extremely valuable if they're fed back into the catalog so that they can be fed into the Watson Recommends algorithms and maybe they're useful to someone else in the business. So you can actually jumpstart and drive those efficiencies um, through other projects by sharing the artifacts that have been created as part of other data science projects. This information was being thrown away and lost. And so every project that got started was starting from day one every day. Well, now these assets are easily shared, click of a button, back into the catalog and available to be discovered and consumed. Number four is kind of more of a CDO play, really, but it's really around, you know, if we're building out these intelligent views of data uh, and AI assets and we're classifying and we understand where our data is, then it all starts to answer questions, you know, where's all my PII data? Who's consuming that data? Which data assets are relevant and the most relevant to my business? Which data assets are not relevant? You know, and, and giving you, from a data perspective, a view of actually the value of your data and different parts of your data. Incredibly important. And then number five is, as I mentioned earlier, that kind of data lake initiative. We don't want to replace your data lakes. We want to allow you to extract more value from your data lakes so that the knowledge inside those data lakes can actually be consumed. So you can layer uh, an asset catalog on top of those data lakes. It can catalog your data lake and other data that's not in your data lake. And then you can really start to surface that up in a business friendly way with all of the intelligence around it, feeding into those recommendation engines, feeding into those productive use tools. So you can then really start to put that data in the hands of your data science community. So this is just kind of like a, a higher level view of, of you know, what we're able to do with our, our knowledge catalog. But this is really around building an intelligent metadata index of all of, your, all of your information. And like I said, that data can reside wherever you want it to reside. You do not have to move your data 
into IBM Cloud to make it part of the catalog. If your data resides in an on-premise Oracle database today, or your Teradata warehouse, or residing on AWS, your data can stay there. But what we do is we allow you to catalog it. We allow you to understand it and provide it in a central index that is then in an easily consumable form for uh, your data science, uh, your machine learning, your deep learning, um, and the consumption of that data. And importantly, it allows you to easily start to bring in new sources of information. If you want to bring in your social data, your sensor data, you can do that very easily. If you have department-level spreadsheets and information that otherwise would not be available uh, across a company in an easily discoverable way, then that data can be brought in and used and made available to the consumers um, of that data. Okay, so some of the uh, differenti differentiating capabilities. This is kind of more of a summary, really. Um, but these are the kind of the key things that we believe are truly important to, um, to, to, to consider when looking at how catalogs can get you to AI. Right, this is cataloging for a reason. We are cataloging to ensure that you are able to do AI quicker, smarter, better than anybody else delivering the most efficient models into production using the best knowledge that you have available to you. So, and to do that, we've built in, as I said, an AI-powered recommendation engine. We've called it Watson Recommends, but we're effectively using AI. We're using Watson to improve your own AI by ensuring that the best data, the most relevant data, is available to be used. There's a whole host of social collaboration capabilities that can be used as part of that, which further train the AI model. And really, the more interaction you have in the system, the more users you've got, the more data you've got, the better that model gets in making those recommendations. These catalogs have to focus on AI. Right? As I said, we're cataloging for a reason. And therefore, it has to go beyond data. It has to be, it has, the catalog has to ensure it can make sense of the data, the models, uh, the notebooks, you know, the connections you have available, everything that's available at enterprise level, level that works with data, having those things catalogued and reused and easily consumable as part of that consumption is extremely key to that. Closely related to that is the integration with productive use. As I said, having a, having a, a marketplace with no kind of add to cart button is, is kind of frustrating. So therefore, from a data perspective, if you find data, then making sure that that data can be easily used and brought into your project so you can do something productive with it, extremely important. Otherwise, you're not going to get, if you have to go through importing and exporting data and requesting access, et cetera, et cetera, then you're not going to get the types of benefits that can drive that productivity into your data science practice. The modern policy activation, this is the fresh take on data governance, how we can start to use the intelligence of our data as well as this activation engine to ensure that data is masked on the fly or, in, or people are denied access on the fly. How can we start to use that to provide uh, and open up more access to more information? Structured, non-structured. Catalogs have to ensure they've got a full view of all of your information. Structured, non-structured data is handled very differently at the collection phase for really important reasons, right? However, as a consumer of data, as a data scientist, I really don't care if it's structured or unstructured. What I need to do is I need to get the information out of that, that structured and unstructured data in the most efficient way. And so using our Watson natural language and understanding to extract the key ent entities, the key sentiments, the key concepts from documents so that I can then start to use that alongside structured data to further inform and further train my models is extremely important. And then finally, your data your way. You don't need to move your data into IBM Cloud. Of course, we would love you to move your data to IBM Cloud, but you don't have to. Your data can reside where it is today, and we're able to provide the same level of intelligence around that data and put it in the hands of your data scientists so that you can start to build AI for business. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I was gonna do a demo, um, but I didn't think we really had time for that. So I've just got some, just to show you kind of the, the real of this, realness of this, I just got some screenshots that I'm gonna take you through so you can get a feel for the, the type of experience we're talking about here. Um, this is all available on IBM Cloud. So, you know, you can log on to IBM Cloud today, you can go and click a button, provision an instance of this, it's completely free um, for you to try, uh, and you can kind of, you know, try out some of these capabilities yourself. 
But the Watson Studio, as I said, it, we're integrated for productive use. So you can find information in the catalogue and then you can click a button and it's available inside your data science environment with Watson Studio. Watson Studio has a whole host of different libraries that are available, Jupyter, R Studio, SPSS, so you can then start to build data science in the way that you want to. We've got a whole host of different runtimes, whether it's uh, TensorFlow or Cafe or PyTorch. You can use these different, um, uh, use the runtime of your choice inside that environment um, so that you can start to use the data and use it with the tools that you want to build the models that's, 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 that's most important for you. Also integrated with productive use for data finder. So like I said, if I want to go and find data and I found the right thing, I actually want to do some prep on it. Okay, and so the refinery allows you to do that. I've got a wizard-based approach I can use as part of the refinery. I can kind of select you know, a number of operations through wizards and apply those operations to the data. But also, if I'm more of a coder, I can actually use R scripts. I can write my own transformations and build my pipeline of operations using R scripts and code. But also inside the refinery, it was really important that we put um, a capability to allow these data scientists to understand their data before they kind of started to use it. And so we've got a whole host of visualizations that you can apply to your data. So you can be confident that the data is the right data that I want to work with. And then once you're done, once you've, applied, once you've built your pipeline and you, you want your shaping and you've got your shaping laid out, you can click a button and that button will go and connect to the source. It will suck in and transform, apply those transformations to the entire data set and it will deliver to you in a CSV file or write to another database somewhere um, the extracted data set with all those shaping operations applied. And if the policy engine's been enabled, if there's data in there that I shouldn't be able to see, that data would be masked as well. So I would have a tailored, masked, uh, governed extract of that data set that I know I'm safe to then go and use for my data science project. I talked a little bit about our recommendation engine. So here at the bottom there, you can see uh, you know, our, our kind of recommendation bar along the top. So that Watson recommendation engine really um, starts to learn all of the, from the digital exhaust of the system. It understands what the data is, how it's been profiled, okay? And then once we've done that, we can see how it's related to other data. We can see who's using data with other data. It can see what I'm doing with data who I'm working with, and all this information gets fed into our model and it learns over time so that it starts to improve the recommendations. You know, when I go and use Netflix from day one, all right, it makes some, some standard suggestions. But the more I watch Netflix, the better those recommendations get. And it's exactly the same with this engine. And this is, and the reason we built this was not just because it's kind of cool, but actually it's all about driving the, putting the data, the most efficient data in the hands of the data scientist as quickly as possible. Um, we've brought in some social collaboration features. You know, this is all about uh, you know, con consuming data and the best people to determine whether the data is value, valuable to them are actually the consumers. So we've put the curation of the data in the hands of the consumers, the people that are using it the most. And so we've built in some social capabilities so people can like and rank and comment on data. Of course, all of that exhaust feeds into the Watson recommendation engine as well, so that you can start to very quickly find if new data sets are coming in, they're being recommended, yeah, you know, there must be something good about this data set for this particular purpose, then that's all brought into the experience so that that can then be used um, to, to guide people to the best data um, for their purpose. I mentioned unstructured. So, um, we announced at the uh, Think conference back in March that we were bringing, that we brought unstructured data in. And this is just some, some screenshots of it. So not only can you bring in unstructured information and there's obviously viewers for that unstructured document, the key part of it, the key thing that makes it valuable to the consumer of the data is the fact that we're running the natural language understanding. So the data scientist doesn't have to read the document. Right? The data scientist hasn't got time to do that. They've got to, get, they've got to go and build the models. But using the uh, AI-based NLU extract, then it can automate that job for the data scientist that pulls out the key terms. Those terms, those concepts, the sentiment, the emotion of the document, that's all then stored inside a JSON file, so that JSON file can then be used for consumption 
um, and data, through data science alongside any other data sources. So like I said, we don't care it's unstructured. What we care is that the information in there, is it relevant or is it not relevant to me completing my task to build a model? Uh, I talked about data masking. So this is really cool. We're, we're pretty proud of this one. Um, so working alongside IBM Research, we were able to really kind of redefine how we could um, uh, open up more data than ever before. And so as individuals are using the system, you can then start to uh, uh, determine whether or not data should be masked based on the rules that have been created, and then that data would be, um, would be masked on the fly. Um, and you know, we're bringing in different masking algorithms all the time on this. Currently, we've got kind of a, a hashing out of values, we've got a randomization of values, we're going to just bring in a kind of an annexing of values in there as well. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, transis tra transformations that we're, that we're putting in place there um, to, to further enhance that. But the key thing is, it really allows you to open up more information, make sure the most relevant information is in a way, in a format that can be consumed in a safe way by the data science team so that we can build those, those smarter models uh, for our business. And you know, a, another good example of how we're really thinking for the consumer is what we've done with data quality. Data quality, extremely important for the collection and the understanding of the data that we have across our enterprise. But we wanted to think what data quality meant for a consumer of information. And so with data quality, we, we, we came up with a concept of, you know, why don't we think of data quality as more of a currency? Okay. Everybody on this call knows that 10 bucks is 10 bucks, and they know the value of 10 bucks, they know what 10 bucks means when they go into a, a store to go and buy something. Well, let's apply that same concept to data quality. What if data quality could become a trusted currency so that we could use that as a quick glance to determine whether or not this data is of value to me or not? Okay, so that's what we've done. Our data can be, uh, <clears throat> can be used to... Uh, generate a um, uh, can generate a, a, a quality score and then that can then be used to um, determine whether or not this data is relevant because if I'm a data scientist maybe I want data that's kind of a little bit more right maybe I want data that has some some you know some anomalies in it however if I'm a business analyst and I've got to produce a report from a boss I probably want more accurate data so I want data that's over you know this trusted index of, of 90 perhaps Right, and then how can we start to use this in, in a, a, along with the policy engine so we can say, well, do you know what? Maybe I am a business analyst, but maybe I'm not allowed to use data that's, that's lower than 90% than quality. Right, so how can we apply the policy engine as well as this kind of this concept around data quality and currency to really start to use that to further inform users whether or not the data is relevant to them? Okay, um, so I'm getting to the end now. So, uh, one of the other points we wanted to talk about was obviously, you know, IBM Cloud, IBM Cloud Private, uh, on-premise uh, deployment models. Well, IBM is, you know, one of the only vendors that's able to provide a proper hybrid cloud capability. And so all of the collection and understanding of data that can occur uh, using IBM Cloud Private for data, we have synchronization built whereby you can then synchronize the, the collection and understanding of the data you're doing, and you can synchronize that across into Watson Studio so that you can then use that data for AI. So it's really important that we kind of build this knowing that a lot of our client data is, is, is you know, on-premise or in a private cloud, and therefore we needed to make sure we could integrate as a first-class domain with those systems for collecting and understanding and governing data, but allowing them to really start to figure out and use that data and put it in the hands of the data scientists for consumption. And so, you know, these capabilities are completely complementary. We can use our unified governance uh, capabilities alongside our Watson capabilities so that we can collect and understand data and then we can consume it for AI. And so we've built a first class synchronization between the two that really allows you to start to use data in the way that you want to. And of course, ingesting into those systems, we can also bring in industry domain experience as well as integrating with third party metadata management systems so you can take uh, advantage of the entire integrated portfolio to further govern and further um, uh, consume your, inf your consume all of your data sources. We don't see a world of one Uber catalog. We believe that you know many catalogs serving many purposes, but being able to ensure that they can integrate 
um, they can share the intelligence um, between them, and that the users and the consumers, whether it's you know uh, for data science or anything else, are really able to use a set of tools that are you know fit for purpose and aimed at really um, uh, uh, really um, you know, empowering the users that are, that are consuming the, the data. Okay, so just to wrap up. Um, um, I started on a slide that covered digital disruption. Digital disruption is happening, we've all seen it, um, and AI is the way in which we believe our clients can remain competitive and be the disruptors. To be efficient at AI, to be able to be, you know, the team that are building the best, most accurate uh, chatbot or engaging customer experience or models predicting customer churn or whatever it may be, you need to make sure that you're taking advantage of your data. Because the one thing that enterprises have over the smaller startup uh, is, is the volume of data. So ensuring that we can understand that data and putting it in the hands of our data scientists who are going to be extremely efficient in doing data science because they have self-service access to that information is fundamentally key to how you win in your industry in the world of AI. To do that, it's really about having an intelligent catalog that really allows these individuals to consume data extremely easily. And as I mentioned, um, it's available uh, today on the IBM Cloud. Um, you can go use it, uh, and we would love to hear your feedback um, and uh, anything we can do to help. Thank you very much. Jay, thank you so much for this great presentation. We've already got a lot of questions coming in, so feel free to submit questions in the Q&A section uh, for this portion of the webinar. And uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Friday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. So diving right in here, Jay, uh, what is the best approach for developing a data catalog inside an organization with hundreds of potential data sources as well as multiple pockets of analytics teams? In other words, how does an organization such as Kaiser begin? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's capabilities that can help you do that. So first of all, there may be existing metadata systems that describe pockets of your data. Um, they're obviously you know, easily integrated into kind of the, the data catalog that's available here. Um, typically, our customers have started small, though. They've discovered that, you know, whether besides their existing initiatives, besides their data lake initiatives, or besides their, you know, their other kind of data strategies, they have a whole host of new sources of information that they'd like to understand. And so they really pick out, you know, a handful of those data sources and add them to the catalog. And it's, and it's you know, it's quick and easy to do. You can add a, a source to a catalog very quickly. And not only can you, do you do it manually, but you can also uh, automate the cataloging. So you can, uh, there's a button you can click and it basically goes to crawl that data source and will suck in all the metadata automatically. So you can start to build up a very quick catalog of a handful of sources. And if that depends on the data, if the data is related, you know, you can kind of detect the relationships between the data, et cetera, and start to demonstrate instant impact because you can e instantly see then from that view what the data is, you know, what the classifications are, what's in that data. And you can open that instantly to the business if you wanted to. So I guess that it's really use the tools available to start small, but also because of the integration, because of the ability to kind of catalog your data lake, because of the ability to integrate with existing metadata systems, then it's kind of a, it's an incremental uh, piece to get to a point whereby there's enough useful information in the catalog that you can then open it up to the business. And then once it's opened up to the business, you can then also allow the consumers to further share their assets back into the catalog, so the catalog grows based on the consumers of the business as well. I hope that helps. Definitely. So, and um, would the catalog be on the cloud, or um, can it be on premise? Yeah. So the Watson capabilities that I've shown today are currently available on the cloud. However, um, IBM's portfolio, Unified Governance portfolio, is obviously available on premise as well. So we have the integration between the technologies so that you can really deploy this, deploy this as a hybrid capability for doing data in AI. Great. And is there any use of graph databases? If so, what's the use case? Uh, 
I'm assuming the question is around if we're using graph under the covers. So we can catalog graph database, if that was the question. If the question is, do we use graph underneath? Um, we don't use a graph database as part of the Watson Knowledge Catalog at the moment. We do capture relationships, and we kind of we, we kind of have a, a graph model that we use to store those relationships. Um, but we do have graph technologies across our, our unified governance portfolio to, to, to understand the relationships between those nodes. So yes, across the portfolio, graph of graph is graph is used, but also you can catalog graph sources as well. Um, and does IBM have any predefined machine learning models for insurance companies? Uh, I believe we do, yes. Um, I don't have them to hand, but if whoever asks me that question drops me an email um, or sends me a tweet, then I can respond and get details. Fantastic. And, and uh, maybe I know, Lynn, you're on the line. Maybe we can get that for the follow-up email as well. Um, uh, and most organizations today don't have an understanding of the necessary data modeling, data architecture, data governance, data foundation that would enable data science and, and AI. Machine learning has to learn the proper data rule from humans. Um, how do you advocate for that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a, a technology solution as well as kind of a, a, a business solution. So, you know, we've got a, a long, deep history in solving those types of, types of challenges and, you know, helping clients evolve their data strategies. Um, and, you know, and that's part of this vision that I've laid out here. You really need to kind of get your house in order in terms of understanding your data and getting it prepared and understood for AI. And then this is the kind of the final step towards AI when you then want to consume that data. So we've got, you know, a whole host of technologies available um, on uh, on premise, on cloud private, on cloud public, that allow you to kind of address that spectrum, the, the whole spectrum of challenges there. So you know, Jay, part of that is is part of a question that we get in almost every webinar is you know how do you get executive buy-in? What's the elevator pitch that uh, that you um, that enables executives to just buy into um, the proper use and uh, management of their data? I think. That's a great point. So I think this has got much easier as, to my point earlier, we are now cataloging for a reason, right? We need to be able to be smart at AI. We need to be able to challenge our own business models to consume AI, to drive new products to market, to reduce customer churn, whatever it may be. Because if we don't, as an organization, and I, don't, I don't mean IBM, IBM is obviously doing this, but I mean, you know, if, our, if as an organization we choose not to do this, then everybody else will, and they will be the disruptors in our industry moving forward. All right, so we now have business level, we can now have very easy business level discussions to say, we need AI to, to fend off disruption, to be the disruptors, to change the way we're operating, to reduce costs, to do things smarter. And to do that, we need to ensure we can monetize and operationalize our data so that it's easily consumable to aid AI so we can do AI better than anybody else. I love that answer. Um, and moving on here, you know, could the Intelligent Catalog federate uh, information from distributed sub-catalogs? Uh, yes, it could. So, um, we, at the moment, we, we can do that today through uh, APIs, so there'd be a custom services engagement where you would use our APIs and, and kind of build the framework around it as part of, you know, a, an AI platform. But IBM is a big supporter of the belief around open metadata, whereby you can have many catalogs as part of a information uh, ecosystem, and those catalogs, you know, capture or collect or consume, allow consumption of, of metadata for different purposes and from different sources from different geographies, but can federate and synchronize information between them. Um, and so some of the things we're working on at the moment are absolutely along those lines so that it's more native to the technology rather than requiring, you know, kind of custom uh, consumption of APIs around it. So going back to an, uh, an expansive, a previous question, how would an in-premise uh, implementation of IBM catalog benefits from the Watson recommendation system? I lost you a little bit then. You broke up a bit. Sorry, could you repeat it? Sorry. So how would an in-premise implementation of IBM Catalog benefit from the Watson recommendation system? 
Yeah, so at the moment we've got capabilities that are being built out across the uh, on-premise cloud private, cloud public ecosystem. But our roadmap is to bring all these things uh, much more closely together so that regardless of where you want to deploy this, then you can take advantage of these, of these different capabilities. At the moment, it would be through a series of, of API integrations that you could do to do that. However, obviously, you know, we want to make sure that this is natively easily available and you can deploy and run wherever you like. All right, and that seems to be all the questions we have currently. I'll give a few more seconds here. Jay, this has been a fabulous webinar. Thank you so much. I love the um, opportunity to geek out here. Uh, this is one of my favorite things <laughs> to talk about. Uh, anything else that you want to wrap up with? Um, no, just to thank everybody for their time. Uh, and uh, please do reach out if you have questions. Absolutely, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love it. We love all the questions that came in. Again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Friday for this webinar with links to the slides, the recording, and uh, the additional links that, that uh, Jay has in here for you, and we'll get some of that other information to you. So I hope everyone enjoys their day, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks to IBM for sponsoring today. Thank you.